Our lives today are dominated by computer technology in one way or another. Whether it be from cars, to phones, desktops, or even space missions, we use it to connect, to create, to entertain, to learn, to ask questions, and solve problems. As of this year, 1.5 billion people either own or share a computer, but only a few know that this machine, which is tremendously integrated into our lives today, is the brainchild of Alan Turing, a genius who caused a colossal turning point in technology 80 years ago. Alan Matheson Turing was a revolutionary thinker and mathematician who changed the way we communicate and handle information today. He marked a turning point in artificial intelligence and modern computing, as well as cryptology, during World War II, setting the stage for modern-day computers and forever changing the way we humans live. Born to Julius Matheson Turing and Ethel Serra on June 23, 1912 in Paddington, England, Alan Turing entered a life full of revelations. His father was a member of an old family of Scottish descent who worked for the Indian Civil Service. His mother, Ethel, was the daughter of Edward Waller Stoney, the chief engineer of the Madras Railway, a company that operated in southern India. He was a child of empire and of English middle class, and at an early age he displayed a precocious talent in maths and science. Having learned how to find square roots at school, he was able to deduce how to find the cube roots of numbers. He also condensed Einstein's theory of relativity for his mom at the mere age of 15. His natural talent and interest in maths and the sciences led him to receive a scholarship at King's College, Cambridge, where he attended a series of lectures called the Foundations of Mathematics in 1935. It was through these lectures that he encountered David Hilbert's Anschaidung's problem, better known as the decision problem. Could a definite method or algorithm prove a fundamental first-order logical assertion with a true or false answer after considering all possible axioms? And if so, could you determine when it would stop? Turing was a tenacious and creative problem solver and would not see a question go unanswered. One day, whilst out for a run, he imagined a hypothetical machine that would read symbols on a strip of tape. It would delete and rewrite symbols based off of a table of rules, following the instructions set down by a computer a person who would perform the operations. The device would then stop once it has reached the answer, or run forever if the answer didn't exist. What later came to be known as the Turing machine was used to prove that the Anschaidung's problem had no solution by first showing that there was no way of determining whether or not the algorithm just required an extremely long calculation time, or that it will run on forever, as you could never know when it would stop. Turing used a definitive example of the undecidable problem and his Turing machine to disprove Hilbert's Anschaidung's problem, at the same time envisioning the first ever computing machine. After Cambridge, Allen began to work part-time with the GCCS. Little did he know that his genius would save thousands of lives and hold a vital significance and turning point in the coming war. September 4th, 1939, three days after the British joined World War II, Turing reported to the wartime stations of GCCS, Bletchley Park. Germany had been using an encryption device known as the Enigma to send messages to the U-boats that was nearly unbreakable by the Allies. The Enigma was like a typewriter, but it had a second set of letters that would light up called the lamp board. When a key was pressed, it would pass through a number of encryption rotors. The encrypted letter would then be output on the lamp board. Each rotor had different wiring and would rotate after a key was pressed, changing the encryption circuit entirely and creating a different output for every input. The code was then reversible on the receiving end, so long as the starting rotor settings remained the same. The standard Enigma had over 150 million, million, million possible encryption settings. The Germans used this advantage to strategically command their naval U-boats, devastating the Allied Navy. Allen was assigned to aid solve the Enigma. He thought that there must be a way to efficiently and precisely decode its messages. Being a mathematician, Allen recognized patterns in the code that had already been painstakingly cracked by Polish cryptographers before the 4th and 5th rotors were added, rendering the Polish method useless. Turing found that there were constants in the messages being sent, phrases that were repeated in many of the already deciphered messages. These repeated lines were known as cribs. The idea was to feed the message containing a crib, such as await orders, through various possible beginning rotor settings that the ciphertext may have been ciphered in until the setting that produced the crib was found. These settings were then used to decrypt the rest of the message. Unfortunately, decryption with the use of cribs was painstaking and arduous, as it was required to be done by hand. 
The great volume of Enigma traffic also made human decryption an inefficient and ineffective task, not to mention the human error involved. It became evident to Turing that the only way to break a machine was to use a machine. So he designed and built the first ever automated computing machine, the bomb. The mechanical behemoth had over 90 rotors that turned in unison until the settings that produced the crib and plain text were found, essentially simulating many Enigma machines decoding a message at the same time. It worked similarly to a Turing machine. The instructions given were to find the settings in which a crib was produced. When such a setting occurred, then the machine would stop. Otherwise, it would continue until it found it. Instead of having a person help it along, it worked entirely on its own. The uncrackable Enigma became nearly useless as an encryption device, as the bomb could find the rotor settings in less than 15 minutes, allowing the Allies to quickly receive deciphered German strategy and orders, information that changed the war allowing effective response to protect Britain's food supply ships and defense against German attacks, effectively shortening the war by two years. In 1948, Allen moved to Manchester, where he began working on the first computable machine to have visual input and output. It had two names, the Baby and the Manchester Computer. The Baby utilized cathode ray tubes that displayed the output numbers in bits, or spots, arranged on a 32 by 32 grid, with each bit charged to represent a zero or one. It was also around this time that he envisioned a method to permanently store and recall data with cathode ray tubes. This was later used in the first computer with recallable storage. The baby was essentially a universal machine, Allen's extrapolation of his Turing machine, where instead of just performing a fixed partial computable function, it could compute any computable sequence. The baby attracted much unwanted attention with the press, it eventually led to Sir Geoffrey Jefferson's attempt in debunking the Manchester Computer Project with his speech on The Mind of Mechanical Man in 1959 where he hymned his views of the innate superiority of the human soul over anything mechanical. In response, Turing released his most perverse paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, in the Mind on October 1950. He began by asking the question, can machines think, instead of the statistical approach to answer it. Turing reconstructed the question into something he called the imitation game. As he explains it, the game is played with three people, a man, a woman, and an interrogator, who may be of either gender. The interrogator stays in a room apart from the other two. The object of the game is for the interrogator to determine which of the other two is the man and which is the woman. Allen then asked the question, what would happen if a machine were to take the part of the man or the woman? Will the interrogator be able to distinguish which is the computer and which is the human. This game later on came to be known as the Turing Test, and is a turning point in the definition of artificial intelligence. The idea is that if a machine were able to think, then it would be able to hold a normal conversation and convince the interrogator that it was human, thus winning the game. Not a single machine has passed the Turing Test so far, but the game has become a benchmark for artificial intelligence, shaping its definition and causing a turning point in the future endeavors of computer science. In 1954, Alan Turing committed suicide by biting into a cyanide-laced apple. Despite his unfortunate end, his life was that of many firsts. He was the first to envision the modern computer with his Turing machine, the first to build an automated machine, the bomb, that would, like modern computers, follow simple instructions. He was also the first to truly define artificial intelligence and what it meant for a machine to be intelligent. Without his work, we may very well be living in a world in which the Germans won World War II. If he had not first theorized the storage of data with cathode ray tubes, we may not have computers with recallable memory storage. In fact, without his universal machine, we may not have computers at all. Turing's dreams can be seen all around us, from small capture tests on the internet, simple forms of the Turing test, to the computers behind the stock market that are constantly calculating mathematical algorithms and equations. Allen was a truly revolutionary thinker, causing a colossal turning point in our relationship with technology, and is rightfully named the father of modern computing.